Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, serial entrepreneurs, and experienced investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup, from pre-seed to IPO, with your host, John Chi. My guest today is Kitu Glory, founder and managing director of Neotrab Ventures, an early and growth stage venture capital firm investing in companies that solve hard technical problems and disrupt non-traditional industry sectors. Neotribe is led by a team of serial entrepreneurs with a track record of supporting and advising startups from seed round to IPO. Neotribe's passion lies in helping founders usher in the next wave of transformative technology. As a Silicon Valley veteran with a career spanning three decades, Kitu has had numerous roles before his time at Neotribe Ventures. Some highlights include working as an engineer at Silicon Graphics, co-founding Healthy on WebMD, being founder and CEO of Neoterrace, and investing in over four dozen successful companies as a general partner at NEA. Over the next three episodes, we cover a wide range of topics, including immigrating to the United States, his experience co-founding Healthy on WebMD, his pivot into venture capital, and the thesis upon which he founded Neotrap Ventures. Today, we'll discuss Kitu's childhood in India, his exposure to entrepreneurship upon arrival in the United States, and what it was like working at Silicon Graphics during the dot-com bubble. Without further ado, let's dive into this episode of the Biotech Startups Podcast. Kitsu, so good to see you again. Thanks for taking the time to jump on the podcast. Thanks, John. Um, really, really looking forward to this, you know, as the team had, and I have been kind of doing our homework, um, kind of figuring out a fun place to start. Um, we wanted to kind of go back in time and kind of dig in a little bit into your early days and your early career. Um, so the listeners out there can can learn vicariously through your lived experiences. Um, so, you know, going back when you, during your adolescence and upbringing, um, you know, what got you into entrepreneurship um, and was there like an early interest to in science and company building? I'd say my foray into entrepreneurship was a bit of an accident. Uh, in fact, a lot of things in my life were a series of accidents. Um, I mean, I grew up in a town called Hyderabad in India uh, in the 80s, you know, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, before going off to uh, IIT Madras for my undergraduate, I had a keen interest in math and science from a very young age. Uh, but it was more on the academic side of things, uh, a desire to excel academically. I don't think there was much of an entrepreneurship culture in India at, at that time, particularly, you know, in where I was growing up. It was only after I came here to the U.S. that I got exposed to that. But even when I came here to the U.S., it was for graduate studies. And then I moved to the Bay Area for a job. And as you can imagine, as a first generation immigrant, my focus was on getting a job, going from F1 visa to practical training, from practical training to H1B. Uh, it the thought of going off and starting a company never really uh, crossed my mind. It was really about you know my my vision was you know very close to my eyes, if you will. Well, that and that's how most of us as first generation immigrants then, uh, and I'm talking the late '80s, early '90s here. And and it's it's interesting you 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 know you're, you're kind of describing this experience because my father is also um, a first generation immigrant and definitely had a similar kind of kind of lens. It was like I'm, I need I need stability. Like I'm, we need to look st like we we didn't move all the way here to to find something that was not stable. Um, so I can totally you know I can totally see that. Um, and when when you were growing no, up, no, I got married when I was still a graduate student. And so uh, I told my wife, then my new my new bride, I said, uh, let me go back to the U.S. and I'll get a job and then I'll sponsor you. And she's like, uh -uh, I'm going with you. <laughs> so she came with me on an F2 visa and uh, we somehow managed. And at that time, my priority was, you know, getting a job so I can provide for my young family. And so it was later... Uh, at Silicon Graphics, when Jim Clark, who was our chairman, left to start Netscape, and which kind of started the internet bubble as we know it, 
that was when I got my first taste of entrepreneurship vicariously, mind you, in the sense that he asked me if I wanted to come join Netscape and in my infinite wisdom, I turned him down. However, he came back after Netscape went public and became a multi-billion dollar company and he became a billionaire. He came back and he said, you know, I want to apply these web technologies in, to a whole new domain and which was healthcare. And that's what started Healthion, which then went on to become Healthion WebMD, uh, and then MDon and WebMD and things like that. So that's when he said, uh, come join me. And so, you know, two of us joined him in that, uh, in, that eff- in that effort. And that was when I first got a taste of entrepreneurship. We literally uh, were the first two folks to wheel in the chairs. We worked out of Kleiner Perkins' office bit to begin with. And uh, we were plotting as to who should we recruit from Silicon Graphics. Uh, in fact, our first 15 employees were Silicon Graphics employees. And we uh, got a notice from them saying, a season desist uh, notice from Silicon Graphics. But that's how we got started. So. And and that's I, I love hearing kind of where the kind of the origins of this original spark came from. And I've, you know, I, I, when I look back on like just kind of my entrepreneurial journey, it was the same way. It was very much accidental, could not have predicted it. It looks it looks more clear when you're looking retrospectively. But in the moment, you're just like, where am I going? <laughs> like, where where is this going to go? And, and you probably uh, uh, and you are sort of second generation, uh, right, within your family. When I called my parents and I told them that I was going to start a company, uh, my dad was actually unsure about it. He was like, you know, are you sure you're leaving a stable job and things like that? My mom, on the other hand, was like, okay, go for it. And she definitely had a little bit of that risk-taking streak in her. Um, And so... Uh, I convinced them that it was all going to be good and that I still was ma- going to. That, that's amazing because the, it's, it's, I had an identical experience. I, I sometimes, you know, and obviously you, you have, you've had a, a much story longer career than me, but I still like 13 years in my, my dad will sometimes come over to me and be like, are you going to go to law school or medical school? And I'm just like, I've been doing this for more than a decade now. Um, but my, but just in a similar fashion, my mother was like, hey, go for it. Like, just, you'll be okay. Let's go for it. Um, and and that, I love hearing those stories. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. I'll tell you a funny story. There was a guy called Shankar who uh, was working for me. And when I recruited him into Healthy On, uh, he went from being a manager to being uh, an engineer, but it was a principal engineer. He was one of our lead engineers and uh, brilliant guy. And his parents gave him a bit of a hard time. They were like, you're going from a manager, you're taking a step down uh, to becoming an engineer, principal engineer. Isn't that like a, like a demotion kind of thing? And he was like, no, 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 not at all. Uh, you know, it's a completely different company, different track and things like that. And, you know, but that's that was the, uh, the prevailing culture, particularly coming from a country like India, where uh, entrepreneurship wasn't really much of a cultural thing. You have to understand that uh, India, at least at that time, and it's changed some, although I'll say there's still pockets of India where that culture still prevails, prevails where failure has a stigma to it. Uh, and there are several countries, you know, I would say even countries like Israel, notwithstanding the amount of entrepreneurship that comes out of it, there's still a stigma around fa- failure uh, within some of those countries. And so India was no, ex- no exception. So you were better off in India working for the government or some established company rather than working for some small company. I'll tell you another funny story. I graduated from IIT Madras and then I had a few months to kill before coming out here to the US. And my best friend and I were watching a lot of movies. You know, we'd go on for an afternoon show, evening show. And one day I came back home for dinner. My dad, he really gave me a tongue lashing. He's like, 
why are you wasting all your time? Why don't you go get a job? I like I felt a little guilty and I went and got a job. I, I looked for some jobs and I actually interviewed at two places and they couldn't be more different. One was a company called Praga Tools, which was an Indo-Czech joint venture, public uh, venture. And the other was a company called OMC Computers. I got both offers. I came back proudly to my home and I told my dad and mom, I like, I got both these offers, but I'm going to go join OMC computers. And honestly, it was an, in fact, an, if I were to think back, it was an inflection in my career source. And my father was like, what? You're walking away from Praga Tools? And I'm like, dad, I'm going to the US. So what difference does it make? I'd rather develop some skills at OMC Computers because those will hold me in good stead. But that was the mindset. And that was the difference in the mindset between the, my parents' generation and my generation. Absolutely. And I know when you were studying in university at Madras, you, you studied mechanical engineering. Was that transition a like from mechanical engineering to you know now focusing at CMC Computers? Was, was that just like a, for, for your parents, just like a shock? That was a shock to the system that you're not only like you're going to America and you're, you know, you know, you're kind of turned down this. You're not pursuing mechanical engineering. Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't think they worried that much about it, uh, that you were transitioning from mechanical engineering to computer science at uh, OMC Computers. It was more the big public company versus a small company. Um, and I'd already indicated to them that, look, the world at that time was moving more towards, you know, having a knowledge of how computers work was a prerequisite. You know, if you thought about how economics was a prerequisite on the sort of liberal arts and social sciences, computer science was rapidly becoming a prerequisite on the uh, on the technology side. And so... While I'm happy that I did the mechanical engineering, I, I wouldn't be where I am if I did not embellish it with the computer science background. Totally. And as you know, as you finished up your your kind of like your kind of the months in between your undergraduate and your graduate studies, did you always know that you were going to end up at SUNY Buffalo? Um, was that like always on the horizon, or was that something that you kind of like, yeah, this looks good, like? No, I think like most uh, students uh, who are graduating from an IIT or an NIT or a Bitspilani, which are some of the uh, best universities in the country, and you had aspirations to go abroad for graduate studies, you typically applied for a bunch of uh, uh, universities. And I remember, you know, I got into USC, but I didn't get an assistantship. And they said, you come here and we'll see. Uh, and whereas at SUNY, I got the assistantship. And so, and my parents weren't, nowhere could they have afforded sending me uh, and, and paying for my education. So we were a middle-class family. And so I had to find a way to finance my own graduate studies. Absolutely. And so USC is not cheap. SUNY before. Your, USC, USC is not, private not, USC, cheap. not cheap. Not and cheap. you know, the other thing that was a kicker was in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition. That was another kicker. So if you went to USC as a foreign national, you had to pay out-of-state tuition. And so you, with, without a tuition waiver and an assistantship, you were done for. Totally. And... So having, you know, your mechanical engineering background, you then got into like dabble into like kind of computer science a little bit. And you ended up at SUNY. I know you studied operations research. Like what what drew you to to that field of study? Well, doing operations research from a mechanical engineering degree was kind of a natural transition. I mean, and to me, OR and industrial engineering were kind of like a quantitative MBA, if you will, uh, John. But what I got there was I got a lot of exposure to computer science because at SUNY Buffalo, I was, our, our department was housed in the same building as the CS department. 
And so I used to bump into a lot of computer science students. I started taking some courses in computer science. And so that's how, you know, I got uh, exposed to it and, and, and developed an interest in it. That's amazing. And I, I love hearing that because um, in, I, I was speaking to uh, a, a previous guest of ours, Manish Jain, and sh- and he was saying that he had a similar experience where he was previously studying physics and then just by happenstance was walking around and bumping into bio folks, started to get kind of that exposure, which is kind of just like opens up a whole new field that you never knew existed. And I just love hearing that because it really kind of shows it, which it may feel a little bit kind of like unplanned, but sometimes you just need to put yourself out there and get as much exposure as you know possible and, and be open to these opportunities. 100%. You know, I, I like to say this, that your undergraduate degree teaches you how to teach yourself. I would be lying to you if I told you that somehow I had a dream one day that I wanted to become a mechanical engineer. No. You know, in India, you write an entrance examination and based on the rank you get, you're basically matched with an institute and a department. So it's very close to the matching algorithm here for if you did an M, what is that? It's called the MCAT, right? Yeah, the MCAT. Medicine yeah. degree. Uh, it's very similar to that. I mean, so you literally uh, fill out this thing uh, during your orientation this form and you say, okay, I want to be at this university and this department and the computer takes over and then matches you and they come back and tell you what uh, university you're going to and for what department. So I didn't know if I would have any aptitude for mechanical engineering. (laughs) And uh, in hindsight, I am so glad I studied mechanical engineering because it gave me exposure to a wide variety of disciplines. I got exposure to thermodynamics, to material science. I got exposure to computer science. I got exposure to electronics, electrical engineering. So it was it was like a melting pot of sorts. And so I'm really glad, you know. Um, I like to say, I thanks to that degree, I know what I don't know. And which helps me a great deal in my current job because the worst thing is if you don't know what you don't know, because then you have a whole lot of hubris around how hard could this be. But when you know what you don't know, you're able to underwrite the risk that you're taking and you know what kind of questions to ask and you know how to price that risk. You know, so that was what mechanical engineering taught me. But It taught me how to teach myself. And I came here and I developed, I I really fell in love with computer science and and then moved out here uh, to the West Coast, Uh, spent a little bit of time at uh, UCSC before starting work at uh, Southern Graphics. And and so how, so how did you make your, like start being at SUNY and then coming out to California, the West Coast, like yeah, yeah, and the West Coast. How did that opportunity come? Like one, how did the opportunity to work at Silicon Graphics come about? Was it was it someone that you had met during your grad program, or was it something where you're just like, I'm going to go out on a whim, and I'm just going to give my hand, uh, give a shot to this? It was really family initially that attracted me to uh, California. I had at that time, I think three cousins, three first cousins who all lived here in uh, California, particularly in Northern California. And so that was an attraction. Uh, And then in terms of the job, uh, after I got married, as I mentioned, I was looking for a job and I got referred into Silicon Graphics by a graduate student friend of mine. And then interviewed there and I got the job. That's amazing. And and then, I mean, I couldn't, uh, I, Silicon Graphics is like a storied institution. And I couldn't. I, I'll <laughs> tell you, John, Silicon Graphics is such a fun company to be at. Uh, I used to come back and tell my wife, I can't believe these guys are paying me to work here. It was so much fun. 
you know, those just working on those 3D graphics workstations and, you know, just even using the file browser to go look at files, you know, and everything's in 3D and things like that. And the projects we worked on and the culture within cell graphics uh, was also very much, uh, it, it cherished the engineers in the company. And so uh, we uh, felt like rock stars inside the company. And honestly, in, in hindsight, maybe to a certain extent to our detriment, because uh, we were very much like a technology-driven company, build it and they will come. And that worked for a certain period of time, but um, it it crashed and burned after some time. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I, I've, all the stories I've heard about Silicon Graphics, uh, you know, they, you know, I, at least, you know, my, what I like in my mind's eye, I'm envisioning like working on things like the Nintendo 64 and Jurassic Park. I guess, let me back up. Were you involved in those projects? Well, I was involved in the interactive television project that we did. The first interactive television project, which was the Orlando project. And uh, Jim Clark actually wrote a paper in SIGGRAPH called the telecomputer. And it was his vision that the television and the computer would converge. And rumor has it that Jerry Levine, who was then the chairman CEO of Time Warner, read that paper, reached out to uh, Jim and said, that's how we got our first $20 million uh, investment into that effort. Uh, and so I was very much involved in the first interactive television system end-to-end uh, it was called the uh, Roadrunner Project. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. I mean, I got thanks to that project. I got to meet Michael Jackson. I got to meet, uh, or, you know, DreamWorks SKG launched on the Silicon Graphics campus. And Clinton and Gore launched their campaign, presidential campaign on our campus. Uh, Huey Lewis performed at the Sultan Graphics campus. I mean, we were we were a hot ticket in town. We Steven Spielberg uh, rented an entire theater to show Jurassic Park to all the Sultan Graphics employees. Holy crap! First day for show. That's so, so crazy. That was a that was a fun time. That was a fun time, and that was when you know I so f- fell in love with being a software engineer. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've had a software engineering background, but and I'm sure a lot of software engineers in your audience can relate to this. You know, you get into a problem solving mode and you get into a zone and it's like meditation. Like when you are in that zone, you, the rest of the world is, you're oblivious to the rest of the world. And I used to love it that much. That's amazing. Um, it's, I mean, that sounds like a, I'm such a, I'm so jealous of that experience. It is crazy. The, and, you know, I, I totally think that like looking back, you know, kind of the engineering kind of, that was like very novel at that time where it was just like engineering first and of that era, it made, you know, it was kind of the kind of hyper growth tech company kind of 1.0, 2.0 kind of of that era. Um, and in terms of like, as you started, like as Silicon Graphics was like hyperscaling, what was your experience with like, you know, in addition to getting into a flow state, like just with your actual, you know, engineering, what was it like to be at a, an organization that's just like rapidly growing? What was, you know, from a, just a business perspective? Well, that's how I got into engineering management. So I was doing very well as an engineer. And one day uh, I got a call. I was actually on a customer visit to Rhode Island, and I got a call from my manager's manager, my director, and he says, your manager has been promoted out of the organization to become director of another group, and I'd like to promote you to be manager of this group, the workshop group. And truth be told, I was a little shell-shocked, and there was a certain element of apprehension in me was like, will my skills as an engineer decay? And I bet you there are a lot of engineers who go through this. 
And I didn't say yes or no then. So I said, Pavan, can I call you back in just a bit? So I, I had to talk to someone. So I called my wife and I said, you know, Vinny, this is what uh, Pavan is asking me if I want to do this. And we discussed it for a bit and uh, said, okay, I'm, I'm going to say yes. And it was, I'd say, a weak yes <laughs> at that time. But, uh, but I said yes, took it on. And uh, I'm, I'll tell you, the first few years of being a manager were not a bed of roses. I screwed up in every which way possible. And I thought I'd surely get fired. And in fact, years later, I, I reminded uh, our vice president, um, I'd screwed up in a big way. And Waiting, who was then our vice president, called me. And I was literally shivering in front of him. Literally. He's like, okay, he's, he's basically going to fire my ass. And he was sitting on this windowsill and he says to me, Kitu, you're one lucky son of a bitch. And I quit. Where's he going with that? And he says, if you were, and I was like 28, 29 at that time, I was probably one of the youngest managers in all of certain graphics. And he says, if you had made the same mistake 10 years later, your career shot. Go back to your job. Don't do it again. Learn from this mistake. Oh, oh my goodness. And that is, I mean, that is the baptism of fire. Like, I, I think, yeah. And and I think those kinds of experiences, too, are like, there's only so much you can do when you read it in a book. Like, here's the theory on how you should manage properly. There's a lot of learning that I got from my my personal experiences, and I wasn't that smart to learn from others at that time, since then I've gotten a little smarter. But at that time, I was making every mistake in the book. But you know what? Failure taught me a lot. And, and I actually like to say this, that you learn more from your failures. In fact, you should make an effort to learn more from your failures. And that's what uh, happened in my case. And I'm fortunate that I went through this and people still bet on me. Absolutely. Um, speaking of like, you know, just like these kind of like hard lessons learned while at Silicon Graphics, do any, are there any standout stories or memories of a specific time you failed, but you, you, you took away a very key lesson? Yeah, I remember a time when I released a product knowing full well that its quality wasn't, wasn't up to par. And the customer reaction was very strong. And that was a hard lesson because, you know, that Pride of ownership is really important. And I told myself, I'm never going to put out something that I can't be proud of. Absolutely. And I think thinking about like, you know, startup, like, you know, there, there's kind of like schools of thought when it comes to like, you know, launching products. There's like sometimes like ship, 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 ship the product and then we'll, we'll kind of like fix it as we go. But, you know, obviously kind of what you're describing is a little bit kind of in the different direction where it's like, let, let's take our time with this. Let's let's think about, you know, you know exactly what you said. We want to get it right if we're going to launch it at all. Um, so I love hearing like that perspective. I mean, engineering is all about making choices and compromises. But there's a line beyond which you're putting out crap and you don't want to do that. Yep. That's absolutely true. And I, the lesson there for me was I should have been stronger as a leader at that time. I said, no, not doing it. Totally. Um, and at, you know, as you are kind of like, go, like 
wrapping up your time at Silicon Graphics, looking back, were there any mentors or colleagues that really left like a lasting impression on you? Oh, hundred percent. As I mentioned, of course, it starts with Jim. I got to know Jim as a person and as a friend and as a mentor. And that was very fortunate. I write, I, I, I've i spoken about this and it's been written about in the book, New New Thing by Michael Lewis. And so I won't bore you with the, uh, the gory details, but I got a chance to get to know Jim at a personal level happenstance by happenstance because he happened to call me for a problem that he was having and I happened to uh, solve it for him and then he would come over to my office and he was the chairman of the company coming over hanging out with me I'm like this low life engineer in the company but you know we had a similar sense of humor I think that was what he enjoyed. He enjoyed coming over to my office and telling me uh, his uh, the joke of the day that he had heard and I would tell him what I had heard. And so we, we just like, and there was no expectation from either side, you know. So he's clearly somebody. And of course, you know, we went on to do Healthy on WebMD. We want, he was my chairman at Neo Terrace and, uh, you know, uh, so he has uh, invested uh, and supported me uh, all through. So he's somebody I owe a lot to. Uh, my director that I mentioned to you, Pavan, Pavan Nigam, uh, he's someone who is uh, a dear friend, mentor, and um, uh, just a great partner in crime. He and, he and I were the first two guys that uh, Jim recruited uh, to uh, Healthy On. And so he's someone I've had a long association with. Um, and where, you know, we have uh, agreed, disagreed, fought over. But at the same time, you know, there's always this affection for each other and for our respective families. Um, I mean, we we become like real close personal friends, right? And, you know, now I'm kind of a mentor to his kids and, you know, vice versa. So uh, that's another person who has uh, been a very important person, uh, started off as a professional relationship, went on to become more of a personal relationship uh, with me. Um, there's an organizational development consultant I met at uh, Juniper Networks who was uh, hugely impactful and again became a very dear friend, Jocelyn Kang. Let me think who are all some of the other people. I mentioned waiting. Uh, I enjoyed watching waiting as a manager and a leader enjoyed watching Tom Jermalak and Ed McCracken and, uh, and how they led. Uh, Tom in particular, I got to know him a bit, uh, but nowhere near as closely as I knew Jim and Pavan. Uh, so there were along the way, some people that um, helped me in my journey. And then fast forward to my venture capital career. There are so many people that I've learned from, and they don't even know that I've learned a lot from them. And I, I mean, I, I, I would agree. Like, I feel like there, there are so many, like, there are clearly these like pillars and mentors who kind of like take you on their wing and like, really, it's almost like an apprenticeship almost. Um, but there's in every interaction, there's something to learn from, from the person on the other side. Um, be it small, large, there's always something to learn, which I've always like kind of thought from as a you want to be model. a student for life. Absolutely. Um, and 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 it's funny when you're you're talking about when you're you you being recruited early days to healthy on on and kind of having these kind of like butting head moments and kind of uh disagreeing. And 
I always think about like healthy, like kind of like co-founder or just like early team and like what makes for a early healthy team. And it's that healthy disagreement, but it, it comes from a place of like respect and it comes from a place of wanting the best out of the other, your, your teammate, um, where it really, that's where magic happens. And my co I, my co-founder, we're, we're like pretty much the opposite of each other. <laughs> um, and we, and you know, we disagree all the time. Um, but it's never out of a place of malice. And I think when I look back on like, I'm so grateful for that kind of, kind of, kind of opposites, uh, kind of coexisting. Um, I wouldn't have it any, any other way. Um, and it, it made me stronger. And the best kind, you know, Jocelyn actually likes to say this, and I totally agree with her on this. She says, you know, trust is when you can have conflict without any kind of attribution of malintent or without any attribution of some hidden agenda. That's what trust is. To when you can have conflict without saying, oh, I know why you're saying this because you have this other agenda. That's when, that's the very definition of trust. Absolutely. And the, and I, and when you have that trust, it just like, as a team, you just move faster. Like you move faster and you, yeah, you, you move faster and you make just like you, you're able to execute at a velocity that just like, if you're second guessing, whoever your team is, you're going to move very slow. And when you don't have that, it will completely destroy the chemistry of the organization. Which I think is something that is, you know, when when we think about like company success or company failures and you kind of do like an autopsy on what happened like I, I, at least as we, we kind of like kind of being a student of of entrepreneurship and startups it, it seems like a lot of the the teams and, and the companies that don't make it is because of there's like this infighting um and lack of trust and you kind of like you kind of destroy yourself from the inside out you know here's the thing right why does a startup succeed a startup succeeds because everyone's pushing the boulder in one direction. The boulder has no choice but to move. And why does a startup win over a large company? Because not everyone's pushing the same direction within a large company. But if you have people within a startup or an upstart tugging in different directions, you know, that's when that company is destined for failure. You know, I like to talk about this in some of my leadership talks. The first few employees in a company feel like owners. You know, I call it this, right? The first, the employees who have had an office in the first office, they feel like owners of the company. They don't mind doing the janitorial work. There is pride of ownership. And they don't care about titles or anything like that. But then you move to the second office as you expand. And now you're hiring the second wave of people. They still want to make some money, but they know they're not going to make that kind of money because by that time, the company has been sufficiently de-risked. And so they're also looking to pad their resume. And so now what happens is you start the emergence, you start to see the emergence of these microcultures, John. And that can be a recipe for disaster if you're not careful. And that's when leadership matters to say, hey, here is what our value system is. Here is what our culture is. And you want to make that culture statement overt rather than covert. You literally want to formalize it so that everyone knows here is how we operate. Here is how we do business. And why is culture important? Culture is important because that gives every employee a blueprint on how to act when no one's looking. How to make decisions when no one's looking. 
because you say, okay, here's basically sort of my, my value system. And here is the best practices of this organization. That's what, that's why culture is that important. And I, I couldn't agree more because I think my team probably gets annoyed with me when I'm, I'm like repeating the same kind of, you know, the kind of the North star and just trying to drive it home. But exactly what you, you know, it kind of like thinking about companies as they grow, you just have entropy. Like it's a more complex system and things are going to get disorganized, whether it be, you know, work processes or just exactly what you said, just like these like micro cultures that are starting to crop up. Um, and so I, at, at least kind of like we're, we're a, a smaller company. Um, so we, we haven't had to experience too many of these like kind of instances, but it, it always seems to like, for me, incredibly valuable to just continue to just beat that drum and just remind of like, why do we do what we do? And this is how we do it. Um, and it's important for hiring too. Like it, it is. Uh, you may have heard the old adage, practice what you preach. A leader needs to preach what he or she practices too. Because that's how you evangelize what your value system, what's the company's uh, value system is. Totally. That's all for this episode of the Biotech Startups Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Kitu Kalori. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to having you join us again for part two of our conversation with Kitu. The Biotech Startups Podcast is produced by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Search for the Biotech Startups Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. Exceda provides research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support paths to exceptional outcomes. To learn more, visit our website, www.exedr.com. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening. The Biotech Startups podcast provides general insights into the life science sector through the experiences of its guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from the podcast is at the user's own risk. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not the views of Exceda or sponsors. No reference to any product, service or company in the podcast is an endorsement by Exceda or its guests.